notice that Jeff Summers is on the sound sound board today. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, thank you all for letting me take just a little bit of time and bring some clarification and and share with everybody uh, the vision of raising the banner. We really have a great privilege and an honor today to have with us a honored guest, Pastor Roland Engel from Namibia, South. Uh, I want to say Namibia, South Africa. They're two different countries, but Namibia is just outside of South Africa, so it's in the southern hemisphere of Africa, and so it's a point of reference in my brain. But just to let you know, it's not inside South Africa. Namibia is its own nation, and Pastor Roland was with us at the O2 Stakeout, and all the men in the house said, praise the Lord. Man, we had a great time this weekend, and you know, some things are raw, raw, and men need raw, raw, but also sometimes we need to have somebody get down and dirty with us and tell us like it is, and Pastor Roland and his son Reuben, who's at the bridge this morning, they shared with transparency from their heart, their journey, their story. And I just want to say it's phenomenal to know and to be connected with people, with leaders who are real and transparent. A lot of people can teach you a lot of, a lot of knowledge out of the scriptures. A lot of people can teach you a lot of principles for living. And it'll get you so far. But what we need is people who will live by foundational beliefs, but then who know the Lord intimately, know his voice, hear his voice, and walk with the Lord. And we have in Pastor Roland a tremendous leader who's been through some stuff, and we heard as guys, we heard about that this weekend and the challenges of what it means to go on a journey where not everything works out perfect and you experience some trial and tribulation, but the thing you learn is the voice of the Lord, that he never leaves you, he never forsakes you, and he's on the journey with you and will walk you out the other side and it will all work together for your good. Hallelujah. Sometimes we don't hear those stories in church. Sometimes preachers candy coat things, and you don't hear the back story, but I appreciate a leader who's transparent and tells you the whole truth because that brings strength to your life. Hallelujah. And Pastor Roland has been a leader and, and then a missionary to Namibia and now has led the church in Namibia. Guess what the name of the church is? Family Christian Center, which was our name before the Abbey. So you can guess there's some similar values and kingdom vision, and our hearts have just been knit to Pastor Roland in this, over this last 24 or 48 hours. It's amazing how much you can just discover family in such a short period of time. And he's a, a man with a vision who goes out into the bush of Namibia in the surrounding countries and works with very very rough situations with very primitive tribes that are still there, planting churches, bringing freedom and deliverance, and his, his passion is missions and church planting. Let's give an Abbey welcome to Pastor Roland Engel as he comes to bring the word today. We bless you. It's an honor and a privilege to have you. Thank you. Is this on? Thank you. Good morning. That's the best I can do in Texan English. So please don't spend the whole hour trying to figure out my accent. Uh, it sounds much different than yours. And um, my R is different than yours. We go R where I come from. And you might win a prize when you can do that after the service. Um, but pastor is such a privilege. Um, I, I am a man of a belief that, that God is in charge of our destiny. Yes. And uh, when I packed for Texas, I never knew that, um, that we, would, 
we have the privilege to be at your church this morning. I was actually said to preach at Dwayne's church, Pastor Dwayne's church. He's my hunting friend. And so they have a few things to work out today during the service. So we pray for them too for wisdom. But, but you know what? I packed this shirt and I never thought it would look like Texan. <laughs> and uh, that's how we dress. Namibia is a, is a country that is about in, sorry, I work in kilometers. So in square kilometers, about 200,000 square kilometers uh, larger than Texas. But we only have 2.4, 2.5 million people in our country. So we drive as far as we can to see a little few people. Um, we live in an African culture. Uh, so when I introduce myself, I, coming from Africa, I normally go and say, I'm happily married to one wife. <laughs> they, they have more. Uh, and I think with respect, they might as be crazy like Solomon to have more wives because I just barely handle one. I don't know how they do more than one. But uh, I have uh, three children. My son was with me. He's second born. He's about turning to 30. And my daughter is 34. Um, and then we adopted a little brown girl many years ago. She's turning 12 next month. And her name is uh, Yuanika, so she actually got a name from the concept of that you are unique. And uh, so, friends, I've got so much stories to tell you, but I don't have time. And uh, I would invite you to come to my nation to come and see. And, but you know what? We have the same DNA. I, I had an amazing privilege to be with your pastor and his wife last night. They talk like, I, I feel like I've known you for years, Perry yeah. uh, Ann. And, and it's been, been brilliant to hear the stuff that they are talking about, the things that's working in their hearts, the values that you have. And so maybe I should go back and say, my church name is Christian Family Center alias The Abbey. <laughs> but uh, um, I think my leaders will kill me because we've changed our vision and values so often because we just want to stay on par with what God is doing. But I really feel at home. The climate is the same. The people are the same. Oh, man, the food is the same. Of course, we love meat. We love... I, I can't say that about the chili that you guys eat. That, that's, I, don't, I don't understand that. But anyway, uh, why, why would you burn your mouth while you need to enjoy something that you eat? You know? so, so, um, so, friends, I, uh, I just want to be myself. Is, is that okay? Yes. So I don't have big PowerPoints because I want to speak from my heart. Uh, I said to God this morning earlier, I said, God, you just take my heart and put it on the table. And, and when you spoke about the Olive Garden, uh, I think that was most probably, and sorry, I can't go there because it will take too long. But when I was in Gethsemane many years ago, um, it was the worst time of my life. I just lost my wife in a motor car accident. My son was nine. My daughter was 12. And you know, God has some way to deal with each one of us. We, we're so unique. And and God just need to deal with me. I come from a Roman Catholic background. I, I grew up with a mom and dad that didn't love God. And so I lost my mommy when she was 10. My relationship with my dad went haywire. We actually never had a relationship. I was actually 36 years old when my wife died. And for the first time in his life, he told me that he was proud of me. And uh, so that was the first compliment I could remember in my entire life that I got from my daddy. So, so when I was in that, in that, in that uh, garden of Gethsemane, uh, I realized something that oil only comes from oppressing. Yeah. And, and you know what? I, I became undone. And one of the most significant things that God ever told me in my entire life, I serve God now for 42 years that I've been born again, spirit-filled and baptized. And in all of this 42 years, the most significant thing that I think God ever told me was in that garden. And I remember when I became undone, this is what God told me. You, you know, when you're in a bad spot and things don't go always well, you think, God, why this and why that? It is the most significant time of our lives that God would speak with you because he knows your heart. It's the time that you become transparent to where you are at. It's the time where you don't have all these things that make you who you are. It's just you and God. And so I was there at that, at that garden, and God spoke to me, and he said these words to me. When my son died, his church started living. Wow. So we're in a season where things come and go. 
And one of the greatest things that I had to die in my life was the fact that I had to perform every day in order to either please my dad, please my leaders, and please God. I actually wish that there would be a day that I could die. Uh, I remember when I still had many baths. I actually had a bath when we were there at the camp. But it doesn't happen often, so I shower most of the time. But I would lie in the bath and I would look at my toes and I say, hey, buds, you know, one of these days you're going to lie in a coffin. And, but it's going to be a good day because I'm going to see my master that died for me on a cross. And there was this thing in my heart that I would... I would just love to go because I'm going to see Jesus face to face. And then all of a sudden I had to deal with fear, fear that I would die. And I use excuses that, you know, God is because I'm so happily married now to Denise, my wife. And we have a brilliant marriage. It's been the best 20 years of my life. And I would use that and God would come to my heart and he would say, Joe, so is that really why you're afraid to die now? You want to spend time with your wife? I said, yes, Lord. He said, oh, you're not honest with me, are you? I said, no, God, I'm not. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know why God would ask us questions that he knows the answer of. <laughs> but most probably it's because he just wants to have me being honest with myself. And so I even had, in this last few months and years, I went through some medical stuff. But guys, I just really had an issue with dying all of a sudden. And you know why? When I really looked in my heart, it was because I was in this place of still fearing God that when I stand before him, I would not have done enough. I would not have been good enough. I would have not given my best. And, and you know what? All of a sudden, the scripture in First John 4 verse 14, I think, comes up and says, perfect love drives out all fear. And for the first time, it made sense to me because the scripture just in front of it, I think verse 13 says, when we come to judgment day, you, you see, there's always this place of yeah. there's a judgment day. There's a day that I need to give an account of my life. Yeah. And so what I want to encourage you today and where I'm going to go with you as a church this morning might not be this coated thing. I, I love what you say, Pastor. I, with respect, I hate coated stuff when it comes from the Bible. It brings people in a place of just oozing, just sitting down and, you know, this is great. Where have you been? I've been in the presence of God. How was it? Brilliant. How was the message? Brilliant. What did the pastor say? I don't know, but it was brilliant. <laughs> and so we have all these things happening in the church. And you know what? Africa is not much different than the United States. And it's not much different than in China. I had the privilege to go to China four times now. I want to tell you something. That church is alive, but they have the same issues that we have. They have got the same leadership issues, the same people issues. Best thing about the world is God made it. Sad part of it, it's full of human beings. <laughs> so I go through journeys and when I come to a place like this and I say, God, you need to give me a word for the people, I believe I have a word for you. Because I ask your pastor, where are you at? What is God saying to you? So friends, I want to take you on a little journey with me this morning. I want to take you as an individual with me on a journey. I want to talk to you as a person, not as a group, not as a family, not as a couple. I want to talk to you as a person. God has got something set up for this church. There's no way that you would land up next to a highway and God doesn't have a plan with that. It doesn't just come easy. Churches don't last 30 years where I come from. I've been in church breaks and church split ups and church going down the drain for many years. Being a church like this for 30 years, you wonder, how did that happen? Well, God was in it. Yeah. Yeah. Question is, so why are you not 5,000 members yet? Well, I want to take you on this journey to show you something this morning because I live in a season in my life where I question where the church is at. Because with all respect, a lot of it has become plastic. The fact something is written upon my church or your church or any other church in this world doesn't mean Jesus is in it. You know what is the saddest part? The churches have all these amazing meetings coming together and I sometimes wonder, where's Jesus in all of this? Because we have everything. We live in a, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? A technological advanced era where we can have anything by a button. I mean, you guys are way in front of where we are at. 
You give money by internet. We give money by checkbook. <laughs> Checks are only now fading out where I come from. It's not that we don't have LTE or 3G or 4G, but, but we're not so advanced. And so where I am at, I am just challenged and I say, Jesus, when I need to give account of where I am at and what I need to tell you when all is said and done, I want to make sure that I as a leader have built right. And not only as a leader, but as a believer, as a child of God. Did I do what I need to do and did I finish it well? So, I always have a hunger for God to do something. The unfortunate thing about church today is we're always looking for a new thing. I wonder why people pray, God, just do something new. Question, why is the old not good enough anymore? Why is the same simple message that we preach, why is that not good enough? Why should it be, as you said, Pastor, sugar-coated? Why should there be anything in terms of what Jesus did different than what we do? And so I have this thing and I say, God, if you would do something new in the church, what would it be? In Africa, where I come from, we have revival meetings. So they would get people and set up a stadium and they would draw 30,000, 50,000, sometimes even 100,000 people. The people that come and minister there, they would be called apostles and prophets and teachers and bishops. So where I come from, everybody has a title. Well, I'm just an ordinary guy. You don't even have to call me pastor. It doesn't matter. But the sad part of this revival meeting is it's always about money. And with respect to the American people, all these Christian TV channels, when I open them, I get sick because 90% of them always want money. Is that true that I'm saying? They always say, well, if you do this, then God will do this. But this do this is something to do about money. Well, I'm in a place that I don't have to do anything for, uh, I mean, God doesn't have to do anything to bless me. I just do it anyway because I love him. God, you don't have to heal me because I gave money. You don't have to give me a house or a car or anything because I gave something. Jesus, I gave my life to you, so you don't have to give me anything. I just want to love you. And so we have people that they sit down. The last one we had in our nation was a guy from somewhere in Africa. His name is Bushiri. If you ever want to do something, go watch it out on the internet. Prophet Bushiri or Apostle Bushiri. I think he's about 28, 34 years old. He's the top paid minister in the world. He's even above T.D. Jakes. The guy who sat next to him for that meeting was privileged to sit next to the man of God and he had to pay 500,000 Namibian dollars. That's 30,000 US just for the privilege to sit next to the man of God. And so they have these revivals where they use people and misuse them. They would say that this prophet is coming. They will keep them in the dormitory or a place like this till two o'clock in the morning, then shut the doors and say, before you leave, you give $1,000. Because you have to be in the presence of God. You had the privilege to be there. So we have revival meetings. We have this mega church trend all over. And people build these huge churches, three, four services on a Sunday, millions of dollars. The sad part of it, nobody knows nobody in that church. I had a friend there, he's been in that church for three years, he still doesn't know nobody. The pastor doesn't even know him. Doesn't know where he stays. When something goes wrong, maybe if you had the privilege to be part of a life group, you could have joined a life group. But we don't care, you just come. It works on the minute. And please don't, don't hear me wrong. Are you still okay the way I talk? Yes. Please, please don't be, if you're offended, please forgive me. It's a good time to practice the principle of forgiveness. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so they have this on the line thing. And there's this one guy, he's got... 20, 50 churches, every church works on the clock, sat satellite-wise, that they do the worship. They start at the time. They stop the worship. They do the offering. Then that guy gets out. Then he preaches in one spot, and it goes out to 100 churches. I wonder, as you said, and we spoke about succession plan. 
What happens to the church when a leader like that dies? Here's my question, friends. If your brilliant pastor and his wife would die today, would just this church still go on? Or does everything that happened in 30 years die with him? And so this stuff started struggling. I, I struggled with it. I, I had a movement of people coming and going. So churches will explode to a thousand members overnight. But you know what? Some of those people, they, they, they do the circle of church. They land up in my church and I say, where you come from? I come from this church. So how's the church doing? Well, we've got a thousand members, but we also lost a thousand members in the last two months. So people come in the front door and they go out. And we call it church hopping. And so people hop from church to church and people have put signs and stunning things like, like, and we also have these things, but they put this above relationship. And you know what is so sad is that people don't have any depth in their relationship with God. You know how I know it? When they go bankrupt, you should hear them. When they want to get divorced, you should hear them. When their children get sick or die, you should hear them. When something goes wrong, then you all of a sudden find out how shallow people's relationship with God is. So this is my first challenge with you. If I had the ability today, my dear friend, to take away everything that you have, your wife, your child, your car, your home, everything, will you still love Jesus? Will you still be who you are today? And that's been my motto for many years that I say, God, whenever people see me, what you see me is what you get. You can take, I know what it is to lose everything. I know what it is to give up your dreams. When we left for Namibia, we left for, with 30, 30 uh, US dollars. I left my country, I left my family, I left my friends, I left my church, I left everything. My wife is a dentist, we just closed the practice. Came into that nation and we started that ministry with 30 US dollars. We had more, but government took everything at the border for import tax on our stuff. So I know what it is. So if all is said and done, all the lights are off, you're all by yourself. Do you still have that thing with Jesus that is everything in your life, no matter what? So I got onto my bed one night and I said, God, you need to talk to me. I need, I need some clarity because churches are exploding around me and people are saying a lot of stuff of what God is doing, but I see the depth of it is so thin. Then I come to a church like this, it's vibrant. You have something that other churches will pay millions to have. Get there, are a 3,000 members church. Can't buy it. So I sat on my bed and I said, sat on my bed and I said to God, so God, tell me about if I would desire a revival, what it looked like. And I, I laughed. My best friend is Google. I went on Google. <laughs> typed in revivals. And you know of many of them, the greatest one that I think in my lifetime that was recorded is the Brownsville Revival. And you may know of it. I, I know you know of it. But you know what hit me? The moment it came up on the screen, Brownsville Revival, headlines, city left in poverty after revival. Second newspaper headline, church on the verge of bankruptcy after revival. Oh man, it just grabbed me in my heart. I said, God, there were millions of people going through that little church. They had Bible schools, they had services. People laughed and fell over. I saw the video clips of it. What went wrong, God? And it hit me. It really hit me. The amazing thing about God's kingdom, when people get born again, they get a touch from God that it just turns their lives upside down. And the moment they get that experience, God touches them, he heals them, he fills them, he gives them gifts and all of that. But when all of that has happened, the question is, what happens next? And this is where I believe the church all over the world gets stuck 
As we get all these things, the promises, we get taught, we get trained. I mean, I have people now at 25 that knows what I know today that took me 40 years to get because of the information that we can give them in a time such as this. And they become so proud in who they are. They talk to the devil if he was his friend. They would speak and pray, hey, how's it Jesus? And I go, man, how you pray like that? Where did you get this, this, this mentality that you know it all, you've got it all, and man, you're just a man that God saved for an hour and a power like now. And then I realized everything just stops there. And God spoke to me and he said to me, the problem with my church is it fell into an entertainment lifestyle. People come to be entertained. They don't come for the presence no more. They don't come to be equipped to go out. They come to be entertained. Man, that thing just hit me like that. And so in that time, I had a lady in my church. I saw her husband one morning and I said to him, he said, what's wrong with your marriage? She says, how do you know it? I said, well, you just told me now. <laughs> Otherwise, you would have said nothing, why? Why would you say, how do you know? I said, so go tell your wife that you guys need to come and see me. God spoke to me. She's in sin. Nobody told me. I just knew it. And so he went back to his wife, told his wife, honey, pastor knows about you sleeping with another man. When she heard it, they left the church. That wasn't the saddest part. You know what was the saddest part? They went to another church, became members overnight, and walked into a ministry of which they became leaders of that ministry and she never repented. While that happened, I had a dream one night. I would like to show you the dream. I had my off weekend. I hope you guys also get off weekends. <laughs> so I decided I'll go to this church and in this dream, it was this mega church. So I wanted to came, come into the foyer into, and the usher told me, sorry sir, you're not allowed to come into this area. It's only for prescribed members and certain people. But we have a, a place here just next to the side. You'll see the auditorium, and that's for our first-time visitors. So I said, no problem. So I went there, and guess what? There was nice couches there. As a matter of fact, there was a piece of lawn and then a fence, and I could see the whole auditorium, the band worshiping everything, and this lawn, I thought, man, this is cozy. And so I went, stood on this lawn at that little hill like this. And I stood on the lawn and I said, you know what? I don't have to preach today. I don't have to worry about what's going to happen. I just want to spend time with Jesus. And I stood on that lawn, started worshiping God. And the next moment, that lawn gave way and it became a deep pit filled with water. And I would just go whoop down the water. And in my dream, I would hear myself say, no problem, I know how to swim, so I start paddling, and yeah, I come up. And <laughs> when I get out and I got on, the next moment, the usher was next to me on the, on the pavement there. His hand grabbed me. I said, no, don't worry, I can. He said, no, 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 no. I have to help you to get out. So why would you like to do that? I'll never forget the words in my dream. Because we are not allowed to lose face in public. And so as I got out, I came close to that fence, and guess what? The picture of the woman that just left my church in adultery was on the other side of the fence. And she spoke to me, and she said, oh, are you here too? Are you also one of those looking for a new thing? And I woke up. I woke Denise up, and I said to her, honey, God just spoke to me. In that time, as I was looking all of this, I came across again the guy that was responsible for the whole Brownsville revival. Uh, what, what was his name again? Um, Steve. Steve. Steve was his name. And so I heard his story, but Steve fell sick. He died a few years, I think two years ago. It was one of the highlights in my church, the Sunday he died. Not because he died, but because of <laughs> what God was doing with me. But <coughs> anyway, <laughs> so Steve was telling the story that I wrote. And Steve felt sick. I think he had some other uh, skin cancer. Um, and uh, while on his bed dying, listen to this, the doctor called in his family and everybody came to greet him because they were 
aware that he would die any moment. While they were all standing next to his bed, uh, Steve prayed this prayer in his heart, and he said, Jesus, if you will save me one more time and heal me today, I will commit myself to lead a million people to you. They say in his testimony the next moment, he sat right up straight, pulled out all the stuff and got out of the bed and walked out of the hospital. If you want to do yourself a favor, go look on the internet and you will find a book that he wrote in those two years that he was still alive. And the book's name is The Avalanche. And it actually came back to the same kind of thing that I dreamt about, this pool that I fell in and this entertainment that people are in. And he said he was at the ski resort and at the end of the day, or we'll make a long story short, he actually stood in front of the ski resort and he was actually trying to tell people, don't go out today, it's too dangerous. I believe there's going to be an avalanche, please don't go. But people just ignored him. And so they left, and not later, long, long later, the sirens went off. Avalanche was there, and they've got these huge sticks, these long poles that they dig into the snow, that when it goes, oh, there's somebody, they could save some people because of these sticks. And he made a statement saying that God spoke to him, and he said, in the days that we are living right now, the word in Second Timothy 4, verse 14, is coming to pass, that says, in the last days, you will find many people with itching ears that will accumulate or get themselves leaders that would speak to them what they would like to hear. Because that's my translation too now. <laughs> and so Steve stood there and he said, he said, what God showed him is that people don't listen to the word no more. They've made the grace of God cheap. We don't talk in church about homosexuality. We don't talk in church about being unfaithful to your wife. We don't talk into church about sin anymore. We just say God's grace is sufficient for all of us. And so we live in a world today that, that actually, if I look at Scripture, I think it's a Scripture in Peter that says that every time people live into that kind of lifestyle, it's like a dog going back to his own vomit. I hope it's not a bad word in, in Texas. <clears throat> So I sat there and I said, God, so if this is where I am at, and this is where the church is going, I don't want to be a church like that. So talk to me. Tell me, what is the key? Everybody should become complete in Christ. I mean, that's my job as part of the fivefold ministry, to train people for the service of, of ministry. My, my slogan is life. I live so that I can teach you that you can do whatever I do and even do it better. That is my job. But if I've taught you to do that, why should you just sit in church and enjoy the company of the Holy Spirit? God, I don't want to be a church like that. And so God took me on a journey. And I want to please, if I have some time, just take you there quickly. So would you please pray, open your Bibles with me at Luke 7 verse 31. I don't want to speak much on that, but I, I, I'll just put it all in line. So in verse 31, I'm reading out of the English Standard Version. It says there, To what then shall I compare the people of this generation? And what are they like? They are like children sitting in a marketplace and calling to one another. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dinge for you and you did not weep. And I look at churches today. F friends, I don't know how things work here where, where you guys are from. But for me as a pastor, I remember the times in my life that I had to perform. I always had to have a new message. I always had to be intact, in place, in time, in perfect condition because if I wasn't there, people would get offended. They would walk out and I'll feel bad because I've lost someone. People get so angry because we go over time. You know, my, my, my roast is in the oven. Yeah, pastor, but you, you didn't preach. I mean, you were just looking at me all the time. Do you want to say that something is wrong with me? And so people have all these excuses. You sing too loud. You sing too long. You do this. You do that. People will always find an excuse. And it's as if church is in a place where we play the song. What song you want me to? I'll play it. You, you, I'll just play what you want me to play. I'll dance whatever you want me to dance. I'll preach whatever you want, as long as you are happy. And friends, I don't know, but where I come from, this is what is at today, at the height of the church in Africa. 
So Jesus says this, what shall I compare this nation with? And then he says this, verse 33, for John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine, and you say he has a demon? The son of man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, and oh man, then this hit me. And he says, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. I realized that my church, those days now, when, when all of this started falling out, I lost the ability to love sinners. I got so radically saved, I was never smoking, never drinking. Neil Diamond was my fan. I mean, I burned all his CD. Okay, that you had the players, the big stuff, and the long tapes. I burned all of that, everything. And then my, 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 my songs that I got engaged with in Christian songs was Fisher Fog. Wash in the dishes, Lord. Wa-. Oh, that was my highlight. We, we don't have the stuff we had now. But, but I, I, I fell out of the world into the kingdom. I would never go to where people drink. I would never go where people do parties. Well, I still don't do it for just going there. But when I go there, I go with purpose. But the fact was this, I lost my love for sinners. My friend, can I say this this morning without taking up too much time? We forgot where we come from. We forgot that we were also sinners. And our lives were messed up. And the sad part is God made such a brilliant job in your lives. And now we expect when people walk in there, you should be where I am at. But it took me 40 years to get there. I forget about God's grace. I forget about his mercy. I forget about the times that I disappointed. And I did a good job of disappointing God. But Jesus loves sinners. How much today in all these big movements we see, people put a focus on sinners? When last did we do a be my guest? And all I invite is sinners. I have a banquet for sinners. I take some of my money in my church. I spend it for sinners. You know what I did two years ago? I'm going to do it next year. I had a program in my church called Be My Guest. So my first guest was the police force and the traffic officers that give me tickets. (laughs) And we invited them and said, we want you to be my guest. And we applauded them, and we prophesied, and we preached, and we encouraged them. We say, we want to thank you for what you're doing for us as a nation and for our people. We had the second be my guest was principals and headmasters of schools. There was this one guy. He was 45 years in education. That month he was retiring. I came up to him, and I, I just appreciated it. He, Tears were running down his face, and he said, of all my years in education, nobody has ever appreciated what I have done for their children. Our third one was service service. Have you ever heard of something like that? So we have a Sunday service, but we call that Sunday a service service. And so we had all the mommies who was divorced or were divorced, whose husband has died, who was left alone, or moms that have children that wasn't married or anything, and we said, you know what? Would you please bring your car? And I lined up mechanics and a wash pool and all of this, and they were in church for two hours, and when they came out, they had new parts, new oil, car filled with, uh, filled with fuel, washed, valeted, or whatever you call it in English, and they walk out, and this car could last them again. We did that all for free for them. Some of them were still sleeping around. Some of them were still in sin. Some of them was the product of this sinful life that brought them where they are at. But somehow, I managed to realize, man, I lost it to love sinners. I've just been judgmental. I, I don't want to mix with them. And I'll get to the point now where I hope to finish, but I tell you something, something happens to a church when they love sinners. Can I give you good advice? Don't love Christians, it's easy. (laughs) But love sinners. 
Can I prophesy over this church? You will not have enough place in a year from now. If all of you can grab hold of this principle that I tell you, if you go out today and just love one sinner for one year and don't quit on him. So I said, okay, Jesus, so here you are. And you gave me the story of how you love sinners and that. And then he goes further in verse 37. He says, behold, the woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at the feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now the Pharisee, who was had been invited, saw him doing this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is and who she's touching or touching him, for is she is a sinner. And if I look, I just want to get my page here, but I think in John, I'll, I'll get to it now. It was Lazarus' sister, Mary. But, but when this happened, Mary's life was already changed. She already had an encounter with Jesus. The Pharisee, he was a leper. He had leprosy many years ago, and he was healed by Jesus. It is amazing when Jesus does stuff to me, it kind of, I don't care what you get as long as I can get for myself. But if he was a prophet, that's why he is a prophet. He knows every part of who you are, where you come from, where you stay, your brokenness, your sadness, your fear, your ups and your downs, your glad and your sad, everything he knows about you. And this woman just came to a place that she said, listen, I, wanna, I just want to do something to Jesus. And then he tells the story of this money loaner. And the, the two guys couldn't pay him, so he wrote off the debt. The one owed a little bit and the other one much. And he said to this Pharisee, he said, now, now tell me, who of these two will love me the most? Or the, 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 the guy who gave the money he said, most probably the one who owed the most debt. Yeah. We, we have a saying, he who has been been forgiven much, he loves much. And so Jesus loved this woman. Well, all of a sudden, you know what? It's like a puzzle all coming together, and I need to hurry. I don't have all the time that I have to do that. But then God took me to the scripture in Matthew 25. And friends, just go through it, because then I can just keep on talking. But in Matthew 25, he tells a story. He says, a man goes on a journey. You know who that man is? Jesus, typically now trying to, he's speaking about himself. He says, I'm going to be the man going on a journey, and I'm going to give people talents. And so you know the story. To the one man, he gave five talents. And to the other man, he gave two. And to the other man, he gave one. And the Bible says clearly he gave it according to their ability. It's amazing. Not that they could always stay with one or two or five, but their ability would help them to get, like Dwayne said yesterday, to a place that they could acquire much more. And then as the story goes on, you'll see that Jesus speaks about when he comes back, then he found this man with the five talents, and when he saw the man with the five talents, he said to him, Master, I have wrought, I have done, I have made five more. Well, I didn't think much of it at that stage. But as I was reading further, he said that he was a faithful servant. But when he came to the man that had one servant or one talent, he actually said to the man that you are a lazy and slothful and wicked man. It's a man that in the Greek it says you don't want to engage. This one talent man with all his excuse being wicked, the Greek word means to be hurtful in influence. The slothful means wanting to avoid but the man in the five talents, the word traded, you can go look that up in the Greek. It's the Greek word in the Strong's 2038. Ergatsumai, it means this, to be engaged in or to minister to. Well, I'm getting to something that you never saw in the Bible before. And I said, okay, God, but here I see you saying to this man who got something from you that he had the ability to make it more by engaging into or minister to. So I found another scripture of this woman that broke the alabaster flesh, opened it, and poured out the oil. It's written in Matthew 26. And I went there. And you go read the story. And as I read the story, 
the disciples were all messed up inside and said, you know, we could have sold this oil and made money for it and give it to the poor. It's amazing the visions that churches have to do something for God. They never end up doing that anyway. <laughs> but when this woman came and she wet the, te- uh, uh, the feet of Jesus with his t- uh, tears and, and anointed him with this oil, he made this brilliant statement. Listen to this. He says, leave this woman alone because she has done something beautiful to me. You, you know when God puts his finger on stuff, then I start looking at what the Greek says. You know what I discovered? That the same Greek word, ergatsumai, to mean minister to, engage into, get involved into, to say that I have wrought, I have done five more, I've done something. It's the same Greek word that Jesus uses when he said, she has done a beautiful thing unto me. And I said, God, okay, you, you, you're busy with me with this whole thing now. So, so how does it work in the practical in church? And then just Matthew 26 going further down, you'll find, and the master comes back. And he'll put the sheep and the goat next to him and he will say to the sheep, well, well done. When I was sick, you visited me. When I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. When I was cold, you gave me a blanket. When I was in prison, you came and visited me. And they would go and say, Master, when did we ever see you like this? When did you ever see you in prison? When did we ever see you hungry? And he would say this, when you have done it to the least of these, you have done it unto me. And friends, my whole concept of church It just went from year to year that I knew doing the stuff that we need to do, get people baptized, get them saved or first saved, then baptized, then filled with the Spirit, then train them in the work of ministry, but then to get to a place on the other hand that we say, so how are we going to take what we've got, take it to the marketplace and let people taste and see that Jesus is good? I preached this for a year. Then God challenged me and said, you know what? You're talking about something that people can't experience. So I said, okay, God, if I want them to do it, I need to go do it. And so I decided that on a Monday, sorry, a Tuesday morning, I would leave my office. My PA is not allowed to ask me where I am at. So from 8 o'clock till 12 o'clock, I'm gone. I only come back at 1 o'clock. So the first day, I'll never forget it. I get in my car and I say, okay, Jesus, I'm going to do something for you that I can tell the people. So what do you want me to do? You know, that time, God just gets quiet. (laughs) Nothing happens. So Lord, just where should I go? Should I go left? Nothing, just nothing. And friends, so I just decided, okay, let's just go where it matters. So I went to our state hospital. Well, it's not like yours. People sleep on the floor in intensive care with their children eating Kentucky Fried Chicken in intensive care. We have holes in the wall. When you lie on the floor, rats run over you in the nighttime. You think it's the spirit? No, no, it's a rat. (laughs) It's filthy. It gets blocked. I mean, termites and hojos. Okay, hojos is bugs. All of this stuff is just all there. So I decided, let me go. Let me just do that. Friends, Jesus, oh man, he he just messed up my theology that day. So there's so many stories, I want to tell you just this one. So I walk into this eighth floor, went down the wall, find a room. There was this one man holding his head. He couldn't move his head. Jesus healed him instantaneously when I prayed for him. And then I found this old man on the floor. I heard that he was about 85 years old, dying of pneumonia. He couldn't speak any English, any Afrikaans, or any language. He could just speak his mother tongue, which, I mean, that's Greek by itself. (laughs) And I asked the people, so what is he doing on the floor? He said, well, he's falling from the bed, so they don't want to get him hurt. So they just put a little thin mattress. It's not more thicker than this. He was lying on the floor. That's where he slept. And when I got to him, he was sitting up straight, and he was just shivering, sitting there. I would speak to him, but he couldn't understand me. And I would ask, listen, do you, 
Do you have any need? What can I do? And then all of a sudden, realize, Pastor, that this guy is about to die. And I, I realized all of a sudden, man, okay, where you come from, Africa, what, you can understand me or not, but if you die without Jesus, you're going to hell. And then I, because I'm a pastor, I started pulling out all my theology and the words that I know, uh, Romans 10, that says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus was raised from the dead, then you will be saved. So how is this man going to confess with his mouth if he doesn't even understand me? And so I went down and, Listen, this is where stuff happens. This is where you get compassion. I, I begged God for many years, God, give me compassion. I would hear him say to me, I don't hand out compassion. And they say, what do you mean? And he's quiet. <laughs> God, please give me. He's quiet. I don't hand out compassion. It, it revolutionized my life. I got to a place where I, I was standing and a woman put a baby in my hands and said to me, listen, man, the moment the baby came in, it, it, it is a pee okay word in church? Yeah. I mean, it just peed, my whole shirt was wet and no nappy or diaper, whatever you call it. And having this, this brown kid on my side there, the woman said to me, oh, pastor, by the way, this child mother just died of AIDS last night. I started weeping. I said, Jesus, I don't know this woman. I don't know this. Child. Why am I weeping? I mean, it hit me like this. Now you have compassion. Yeah. I said, what, what do you mean? He says, now you, listen to this. Now you feel what I feel when I am in the shoes of those who are broken. Yeah. Yeah. You only find that, my dear friend, in the marketplace. Yeah. We don't find it here. Yeah. This is the place where the gifts of God works the least. We don't see miracles happen because we don't need a miracle or healing most of the time. So I was in this hospital and I, and it just grabbed hold of me. So I went down on the floor and I grabbed this old man. Now remember, they don't have showers like us. They never shower. You smell them when you come in and when you go out, everybody smells you for another day or so <laughs> because of that stench that just sits with you. And I sat with this man. I just had this empathy and this... This, this, this compassion for him. And by, by, by how would I say, the, the, as the Lord is my witness, the next moment, this man that couldn't speak any Afrikaans or English, out of his mouth came these words, water, water. I looked around and I found one of these small bottles that you can just open with a thing there. It was just behind him. So I took the water and put it to his mouth and he starts sipping it. You ever hear God speak to you? That moment. Oh man, that moment. Jesus spoke to me. He says, when I was thirsty, yeah. <laughs> you gave me something to drink. Yeah. I came a few days later. I was dead. You know what Jesus would do to save somebody from hell? And it wouldn't fit my theology and my patterns and my quotes. If he was the one that died for sinners, he'll go anyway to save an old man like that, even by just me touching him and giving water. For the Spirit of God in you is able to break people from darkness. And you and I don't know what he does in people's spirit. So since that day, you will find me in hospitals. I'll be on a walkway. I will sit in an office with somebody. I will sit on a stoop. I'll be at the, at the till that I pay my groceries with. My antennas is always up. Jesus, when I can do something good to people, you just tell me. Every night, my, my trash, when it goes out on a Sunday, it has a package of food on top of it for the homeless. When I drive, so I will pick you up. I don't care how much you stink or smell. That lady that we were there at the north, they, they cover them with this red mud. and It's not mud, it's, 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 it's a powder that they mix with fat or calf, cow fat. I often say they don't stink, but they smell peculiar. 
But, but when they touch you, everything is red. So they, she had a problem with her baby. My whole new car was red inside. It doesn't matter no more. And so I have this urgency. So I go to a hospital. I would walk into a ward where children, their eyes are gone. The cancer is hanging like stuff on their, nobody can. And Jesus doesn't heal them all. But I would feed them. I would hug them. I would tell them Jesus loves you. And people now, they, I, I'm going to go this full time next year, God willing. That's going to be my vision for the year. But people, they put in leave for one day. They go with me. And then I do all of these things. I see how God ministers to people and how he heals them, how he just makes them feel special. Yeah. And the people watch me and they look at me and they stand at the left. They burst into tears. I say, my friend, why are you crying? He says, I've never seen it like this. You spoke to me for years and years. I never understood it. But now I understand. My dear friend, for you as a church today, I love you. I love what I see. I, I smell God's presence with you. I love your openness. I love the way that you interact in all of this. This is brilliant. There are many churches that are 20, 30, 100 times the size of your church that doesn't have what you've got. But I believe God has got a word for each one of you today. You want to take this church to another level? Don't introduce another course. Don't try and... And, and highlight something more that you've already got in, in, in control of, or I don't know how to say that, but, but if I can really encourage you, get a brother, get your wife and say, we, we need to go somewhere this week. We, we can just go sit on the pavement and wait. But my daughter, she, was, she had this thing, I'm going to tell somebody that Jesus loves him. So she went to the IRS, our tax guys there, and, and on her way, she saw these guys with the guns, all dressed in black and that. And she says, okay, Jesus, I said I will tell somebody that I, but, but my dad will get me in prison tonight if I go. And Jesus just told her, go back. And she goes back and she says, sir, sorry, my, my, please interrupt. If you want to chase me away, please. But you, sir, can, can I just tell you, thank you for what you're doing to our country. Thank you for the gift of God on your life. I just want to tell you, Jesus loves you. So the man pushes out his hand. He says, ma'am, you wouldn't know how much I needed you. Oh, by the way, I'm the vice president of Namibia. You don't know who you're going to meet. You know who's waiting for you. Last thing I want to say is, Jesus is always on the lookout for somebody that will move out of his comfort zone and say, God, I had a brilliant service on Sunday. You met me, but six days of this week, this is yours. Whatever I have to give, I'll give it to you. And we're so scared to do it, but it doesn't matter. I can just come up to you and say, honey, you know Jesus loves you, and I hope you have a great day. I can just give you a bottle of Coke and say, you know what? Jesus loves you. Be blessed. And it turns something in people's hearts. And then all of a sudden, the things that are so immaculate, so big in God's kingdom that we sometimes fear to tread in. The impossible starts happening. End up with a story. Because of this lifestyle, I want to grab hold of every opportunity. So one day in China, they bring me this old woman. So, so, sorry, ladies. Uh, 70, <laughs> uh, I think she was 73 years old. So if you're that age, I'm sorry. You're not an old woman. You just matured. Um, <laughs> Where I come from, we call them, uh, our ladies are antique. Uh, so, but anyway. So they brought me this woman, and, and she was sitting in front of me. I couldn't understand the word, so I used the interpreter. And she had a disease for 17 years now that half of her body, she lost all the, the feeling in it. She couldn't feel anything. So you could prick her or cut her or anything. It, it wouldn't do anything, but internally it created so much pain. She spent all the fortune she had on doctors. Nobody could help her. And they brought me this woman, and I stood there by her, and guess what, guys? There's something about compassion that you can't, you, you can't prevent it. Oh, my heart just went out to her. And the next moment I started praying for her, and I saw her watch. It was 20 past 3 in the afternoon. And I just walked on the water and I said to her, honey, Jesus tells me that before 12 o'clock tonight, you're going to be healed. 
by 11 o'clock, it was zooming. They've got WeChat. The most amazing miracle took place. God healed that woman from head to toe completely. The next morning, we went on an outreach, 160, what is it, 100 miles from where we were at. They drove people with buses to come and come. We started the service at 10 o'clock in the morning, and I ended the next day at half past three in the morning at one hour break. I saw miracles happen. I saw people get healed, legs grow, stuff happen, people filled with the Spirit, all just ordinary people. I want to encourage you this morning. Sorry for taking so much of your time. I want to encourage you. God, I want to use you, ma'am. Wherever you are at, at your work. Don't laugh at me. I, I, I go to a hotel where I stay. I sit on the toilet, and when I sit there, I pray. And I pray, Jesus, when the next man comes into this hotel room and he sits on this toilet, I pray he'll have an encounter. I've never seen, maybe one day I'll see what happens. But just love sinners and invite people to taste and see that God is good. And may this church never be an entertaining church. Let's, let's have good times together. But our mission is let's take our marketplace for the kingdom of God. So is there any of you that want to say, God, here I am? I've never done that before. I've never had that boldness. Some of you are going to see healings through, flow through your hands. Some of you are going to start prophesying. It's not going to be, up, not, nothing like, just, I believe God's saying. So if, if you want to say, God, use me like never before, would you just stand with me? And this is what we declare this morning with everybody standing in this building, Father. I want to say before I pray, prophetically, that your child one day will grow up and give testimony of what God is starting today in this church. I pray for every man and woman. God, sorry, please forgive us that sometimes we've made it such a thing about me. Sometimes it was just heal me, help me, bless me, give me a word, encourage me, Lord. And it sounds weird if I may pray this, Father, but for me, if ever from this day I get nothing from you again, it's okay with me. But just release me in every person that stands this morning to say, God, here I am. Give me compassion where it matters. Give me a love for sinners. I want to open my doors to people that doesn't even love you or they hate you, that I will open my doors and Talk to them about God's goodness. And I pray, Father, that from this day, it's a simple prayer, that these people standing, their lives will never be the same again. And when people drive past this highway, past this church, the testimony will go out of this house. That church loves all people, no matter what. You can go there, they love you anyway. And I pray out of the simplicity of where we are at and what we have to give. Would you take the little bread that we have and the little few fishes we have, God, and you do a miracle in people's lives. I honor you for that mo- this moment. And I pray, Father, that that word will never leave their hearts this year. And that even in the leadership, they will start planning about what are we going to do to make Jesus look beautiful in our neighborhood. And I give you all the honor for that. In Jesus' name, Father. Amen. 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 God bless you. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. How many of you realize we've heard from the Lord today? An awesome challenge for the next dimension of the kingdom operating in our lives. And I just want to, I'll share two quick stories that just touched our hearts. This last week, we had an opportunity to just be with one of our community groups and spend the evening with them. And as a pastor, that's a wonderful thing to do to get to hear what's what's happening in people's lives and hear their stories. And in that community group, we're talking about, guess what? Open-hearted and open-handed living. 
And so two of the stories that couples shared were about being in the community. One story was about being at a restaurant and having the opportunity to bless their waitress with something that they had admired, the waitress had admired um, a piece of clothing and they were able to just give them that piece of clothing and bless them and that waitress just cried that they would care and that they would be so generous and that they would care about her and the other story was someone was in a, a local store and the Lord just spoke to him to tell the cashier that he loved him he loved her and I so appreciated the honesty because those are not always the easiest moments. And so she left without saying, the Lord loves you. So when she got home, the Lord said, now go back and take an offering. So she had to go back, wrote a card and put a $50 check in it and gave them, gave that young lady that card and said, the Lord wants you to know that he loves you and he cares about you. And he sent me here to give this to you. And she just wept. It so moved her, she just wept. It touched her life. And our prayer in that community group was, Lord, let that increase. I open my ears to hear what you're saying. I open my eyes to see where you're sending me. Let that compassion, let those acts of kindness increase. This so is what God's called us to be and do. I love great revival meetings. I love great moves of the Holy Spirit and people get, getting healed in meetings. But the greatest miracles are when we're just obedient Christians led of the Holy Spirit to touch people's lives in everyday life wherever they are people need to know the love of a good God he's not condemning them he loves them he died on the cross for them to heal them to set them free to bless them Hallelujah. And we're the ones that get the opportunity to share that. Can I just add, too, um, at that community group, one of the things I shared was if you've grown up in church, sometimes you've been kind of beat over the head for not doing this. And this is not that today. And I, I was like that. I didn't know how to witness to people. I've shared this here before. I didn't know how to witness to people according to the plan and out of condemnation. But the Lord will work with you where you're at. And so the Lord gave me this. I shared this at the community group. This might sound silly, but I obviously have really short hair. It's a thing. And I have this thing where I'll be out somewhere and there'll be another short haired lady. One was a flight attendant just walking through DFW. And he'll have me say, her, tell her you like her hair. Now that may seem silly, but what it was doing was the Lord was bypassing my performance orientation and helping me tap into the authenticity of who I really am. And nine times out of 10, that conversation turns real. And they just, you know, you tell, you tell someone you like something about them, but you have their heart in a way you don't if you're challenging them with something they think is foreign. The other one, and you'll laugh, but I shared it at the community group, why not share it here, is the smell of patchouli. You should laugh. <laughs> I love that smell and I'll be in a store and someone will have it on and I'll smell it and I'll be like, is that patchouli? And nine times out of 10, they'll go, you noticed, you know that smell? Okay, in the 70s, it was to cover up drugs. That's not what I feel <laughs> about patchouli. I just, I really just wanted to add, if you've ever been beat down and condemned for not reaching out enough or your own performance at it, this is not that day. This is the day for the Lord to awaken the real you who really wants to get out there and connect 
with the Jesus you found, in the colors you found him, in the life you found him. And I want to commission you to find the personalized plan. That's what he was imparting. He found his plan. It's the spirit of that message today. And I'm just too happy about the fact that the Lord wanted to personally coach me to get me past my fear of not performing at what we used to call witnessing. Instead, he wanted to show me that he died to make me a witness, not tell me to witness. So when you feel those little impulses, if any of you come from a past like me where you were beat over the head with it and you didn't think you performed well, I want to tell you, he may speak to you, tell that, tell that guy you like his boots. You may get some impulses like that that feel like they're coming from the place of God. Act on them and just see what happens. Because this is about you being you with him living in you. It's not a religious performance. So we just release that as it's a, it's a can I use the word new? It is a new day for an old truth. Matthew 13, 52, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven's like a man that brings from his storehouse things both new and old. The new is the old coming around being relevant in this moment. So I believe that we're in the best day of our church ever. And I believe you, every one of you here, being you with Jesus in you is a part of that. How are you gonna welcome the world to the hug of the Father? Amen. If that's you've you've stood to make yourself available, can I just lead you in a simple prayer to ask the Holy Spirit to lead you in open door? So let's just pray this together. In the name of Jesus, I choose today to open my ears to hear, to open my eyes to see how you will lead me, how you will use me to reveal your goodness to hurting and lost humanity. I make myself available. Use me in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Can we give Pastor Roland a big hand of appreciation? Hallelujah. And then we're going to give you an opportunity to sow into their life, into their ministry as they carry the gospel throughout Namibia and to the nation. So our ushers are going to put out baskets at the front and you can give electronically if we want to pop that slide back up and you can just put guest speaker if you're giving electronically. Our Abbey prayer partners are going to make their way down to the front. If you're here today and you don't know the Lord Jesus as your Lord, he paid the price for you. Please don't leave without just coming and letting one of our prayer partners pray with you and hug you and embrace you and let the Father's love just wash over you and receive you into the family of God. If you're a first-time guest with us, our, our vision team, our leadership team would love to just greet you, shake your hand, tell you thank you for being with us today and give you a gift before you go. So we're going to make our way out to our left and your right through those double doors to our dining room. And we have a gift for you. So please just stop by there real quick and then we'll see you next week. God bless you. You are loved.